All right, go ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone. So first of all, I have to to, to excuse my English, and uh, also excuse this uh, tasting because it's going to be the first tasting as a connecting tasting. So it's going to be the the first time for me. So if you have any question, if you didn't understand because the connection is, I'm sorry for wine connection, but I don't have the same connection in in, in France. So, but if my connection is bad. Uh, because I'm in the middle of the vineyard, so I don't know if I'm going to have exactly the same connection as you. That's really the, the key things. So, um, yeah, welcome to the Loire today. The best wine region in the world. And I'm very, very, very objective, as you can imagine. So my name is Pierre-Jean Sauvion, and I'm the uh, fourth generation of winemaker in my family. But in my family, we don't say winemaker, we say pleasure maker. And you, you can't read it, I don't think so, but it's written on my business card. It's written, façonneur de plaisir in French, pleasure maker. At the end of the tasting, I will probably tell you a little story about this business card, but that's another story. Anyway, but that's, yeah, in my family, we say pleasure maker because we want to give pleasure to everybody who drink a glass of wine. Because obviously, Wine is a lot of histories, it's a little bit of a technique, stairwear and so on, but it's something you want to share with someone. And that's pleasure. So that's really, for me, the key things about the, what we've done. So I'm the fourth generation. So the story started with my uh, great-grandfather. And my great-grandfather used to be a pig negotiation. So he was selling pigs to retailers, shops, butchers, uh, the whole supply chain. And when you are back to the uh, late 20s, early 30s, and you are in the uh, business, every deal needs to be done around a glass of wine. Even if you were selling cars, house, trees, bicycle, motorcycle, whatever, you close the deal, you check hands, and you drink a glass of wine. And my great-grandfather was drinking seven glasses of wine, Loire, obviously, in order to sell one pig. And he was selling 20 pigs per day. So if you do the mass, he was kind of a, a navy drinker, I should say, a master in drinking Loire wine. So he decided to, uh, to become a, a Loire wine specialist, and that's the reason why I'm the uh, fourth generation. There is a fifth generation, and uh, he's 10 and she's eight. They drink wine already. Don't tell my wife because she's going to kill me. But anyway, now I'm, I know I'm registered on YouTube, so I'm dead, almost dead now. But yeah, they drink wine already. You have to start earlier to have a, be, a good knowledge about wine. So that's kind of my, uh, my drawback in the, uh, in the wine industry. And uh, my little garden is the Loire region. So as an introduction, I told you that the best wine region was the Loire region. If somebody says it's not true, tell him. Some, some people from the Loire tell me it was the best one. And I'm going to call them after that. And I'm going to explain them after that. So I'm going to give you my numbers at the end. And whenever they want to call me, they could call me. And I would explain the exact same story. The Loire region. And it's going to be the first time for me. I'm going to share my screen. First time ever in my entire life. That it works? Good. So that's the Loire River. Starting from the uh, west coast with the Muscadet region, going towards the center, Sancerre and Pouilly Fumé. So this is quite a long river because it's from this region to this region, it's at least six hour drive. So it's a spread area. When I said spread, it means that you've got a lot of diversity in the Loire. Every color, white, rosé, every sign, sweet, off dry, sparkling, you could find everything in the Loire. So that's one of the, for me, the, the best thing. And then when you look at the map of France, a little bit further down here, when you look at this map, you could see that the Loire River is on the northern part 
of France. So people usually go on holiday on the south. And unfortunately, I'm in the region where we people are working. I think Pierre is slightly cut off audio. Hi, Pierre. Can you hear us? Hello, hello. Hi, Pierre. Hello, everyone. Are we, oh, all right. I think he got disconnected. Uh, as he was explaining, he's in the Loire Valley, so he's in the vineyard, so it's maybe a bit of a botchy, uh, sort of a bumpy connection. Ah, oh, he's back, he's back. I think you're muted, Pierre Jean. <laughs> Yes, you can hear me? Yes, yeah, good. So, northern part of France means cool climate and that gives the, uh, the identity and the profile of the wine. If you are in the wine business and everybody will talk about the cool climate Shiraz, the cool climate Chardonnay, the cool climate Riesling, the cool climate Tempranillo and so on. For the Loire, no problem. The whole region is on a cool climate. So we don't have this problem. You know, people are talking about global warming. Yeah, I have to say, yes, it's true. Yeah, there is a global warming. Weather is changing, definitely, yes. But in the Loire, we still have this fresh hair would give to the wine this really, really unique character. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, in the Loire, we do have some really unique and specific grape variety, like Melon de Bourgogne in the Muscadet, kind of a unique because it's only growing in this region, in the uh, Pays Nantais. We do have the Grolo, and we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, uh, a little bit later with the uh, Rosé d'Anjou Chateau de Montgueret. Grolo, we do have the Sauvignon Blanc, which is iconic in the Loire, and we do have the uh, Chenin, which was born in the Loire River. So that's really the iconic grapes, and if you're talking about the red, you're talking about Grolo and Cabernet Franc. So that's roughly the, the, uh, what we will find in the, uh, the Loire region. If you have to, to remember something, so that's, yeah, roughly the, the Loire region. Just, you know, Chateau de Montguerre, I don't know if you could see my uh, mouse, but it's just right there. That's where you will have Chateau de Montguerre, on the left bank of the Loire River. So, Okay, so, uh, tac, tac. No, uh, try to, uh, try to, up. Oh. Yes. Now, yeah, the, uh, if you have to remember one thing today, it's easy. In the Loire, wine needs to be fresh, fruity, and friendly. That's the rules of the three F. Fresh, fruity, friendly. That's the only thing. So that's an easy wine lesson. Loire is the best wine region in the world. Easy. The rules of the three F, fresh, fruity, friendly, and pleasure maker. That's pretty much it. Now we're going back to more details with the um, Chateau de Montguerre. So what is Chateau de Montguerre? So you're in the Anjou region, so the taken part of the river. Muscadet was on the, uh, close to the ocean. Then you drove an hour and arrived in the Angers, Anjou region. And uh, Chateau de Montguerre, it's a very, very old property because the chateau, which is actually this chateau, I don't know if you could see it. This chateau is a property which has is a Napoleon style. And it was built in 1880. So it was not from yesterday, but the day just after that. So yeah, a long story about it. It's just facing the whole Loire 
valley, building on the top of the valley, and the garden, the vineyard, because I don't say vineyard in my place, I say garden, because I look after my vineyard like you look after your garden in your place. So that's the, the, really the idea. The garden is 100 hectares and on the wall valley. It's divided in three big regions, which is uh, Niol sur Leon, Passavant, and Cléret. Just forget the name. It's really tiny, so, but it's the uh, Anjou region. In the Chateau de Montguéret, we do produce um, the iconic wine from the Loire, Rosé d'Anjou, Cabernet d'Anjou, Crément de Loire, Saumur Mousseux, Saumur Blanc, and Saumur Rouge. But yes, we're going to definitely talk about the uh, the Rosé d'Anjou for one big reason. If you look at the, the Loire production, and also the uh, Chateau de Montguéret, the Loire is the second biggest region in terms of Rosé production, AOP speaking. The first one is uh, Côte de Provence, so the south where people are going on holiday. Yeah, unfortunately, again, it's where I'm working, it's on the north. But the second region is the Loire. Rosé in the Loire is really important because it's 27% of the world production. So it's a massive, massive uh, uh, color for us. The first one is white and then it's rosé. And uh, we, we, we also have kind of a unique uh, profile in the Loire and we call it uh, off dry. I don't, it's not medium sweet, it's off dry. What, does us, what, 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 what is really off dry? Off dry means a little bit of a tenderness, thanks to the sweetness, but balanced with the acidity. Medium sweet means sweet. Off dry is always a balance between the sugar and the acidity, always. So this uh, Chateau de Montguéret, Rosé d'Anjou, it's a Chateau de Montguéret produced with three grape varieties. Gros Lot, so that's a unique berry from the Loire region. You could spell it G-R-O-S-L-O-T, or you could also spell it G-R-O-L-L-E-A-U. Yeah, yeah, sorry, we are French, we like to make it complex. Same berries, two different names, but that's, that's the idea. So, Gros Lot. Then we do have a little bit of a Cabernet Franc and Gamay. But the, 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 the foundation of the cuvee, it's really, really driven by the Gros Lot. So, Gros Lot for 70%, 20% of Cabernet Franc, and the rest is Gamay. Why we do this, uh, this balance? It's important because when you talk about rosé, you talk about the color. The definition of the wine is first the color. The good thing about the Gordo, it's it doesn't have a massive, strong, um, forget the name, his name is Antocyan, but that's the pigments who give you the, uh, the color. It doesn't have a lot of a pigment of uh, Antocyan. So you always have with the uh, Gordo a pale, pink uh, petal of roses color. And you all, you, you all know now that when people are drinking roses, they almost want to drink white wine. Tavel is over, the big, massive, I like Tavel, huh? I'm not saying that Tavel is bad. Huh? I'm just saying that the color is really important and now people are more on the pink light -like color uh, rosé and Gordo doesn't, doesn't have this nice, uh, doesn't have this uh, strong color. Then we use Cabernet Franc because Cabernet Franc has some nice acidity on it to kick the, uh, and some tannin, to kick the, uh, the sweetness. And the gamay will give you the spiciness. So, sweetness gros lot, acidity and tannin cabernet, spicy from the gamay. So that's why we use those three grape variety in the uh, Chateau de Montguéret. Now, we are talking about the terroir. What is terroir? You know what is terroir? It's a French bullshit. It's an excuse for French bad wine. Usually when you have a problem in the wine, people say, well, it's, it's terroir. It's terroir. It's going to be good in 10 years time. No. When a wine is bad, it's going to be bad forever. 
a wine will be good at its beginning till the end. Now, but back to terroir, it's, for me, it's really important. Terroir, it's not only the hearse. Terroir, it's the uh, combination of different elements. Obviously, grape variety, because without any grape variety, there is no wine. So the grape variety linked to the soil, and that's usually people are talking it's only soil, but it's part of the terroir, it's not only the soil. So grape variety, soil, weather, if it's sunny, dry, windy, wet, and so on. And someone, a winemaker, men, women, I don't care, but someone, because you always have somebody inside a bottle of glass, because you always have somebody who has an idea of what you want to do. It doesn't mean that, that it's, uh, it's the best ever, though. No. It's just beyond a bottle of wine, there is a willing. Somebody wants to give something to someone. So if you're missing one of them, you're missing the terroir. The terroir, it's grape variety, soil, weather, and a winemaker. That's really important. Soil speaking. What is the soil speaking? Soil is the, uh, the other really important thing about the, uh, the Loire and the Chateau de Montguerin. It's the uh, choke. You know what is choke? This white hearth and choke um, in the Loire. If you look at billion years ago, all this wine region was overflowed. And every little uh, uh, shellfish and sediments just fell down and uh, created our terroir, this chalk element. And that's really important because the chalk is um, the regulation of the water. And to get the perfect uh, maturation, the perfect um, way to get the brightness from the berries is regulation of water. Because wine needs water, not too much, not too dry. Uh, you, you have to know that a winemaker is never happy. Eh? It's, al it's always too warm, too windy, too dry, too wet, not enough sun, not enough. We never, we never be happy, never. But that's, that's reality. But chalk works like a sponge. So if it's raining, like it is today, like it's pouring water, the chalky soil will absorb, suck all the water. And when it's getting drier, like it's going to be tomorrow, crossing fingers, uh, the soil will give back to the vine some humidity and moisture. So thanks to that, you got a perfect water feeding regulation from the 1st of January till the 31 of December. And that helps the rules of the 3F. Again, fresh, fruity, and friendly. Choc, bring this freshness to the wine. Northern part of France, freshness, and fruity, using the berry that we have as the fruit in the fruity character. We are not talking about the uh, big body that 40.5% 40, 40 of alcohol over oaky over no. We are talking about pleasure. We are talking about berries inside the glass. Because when I when I make a wine, what I want, I want you to be. If you close your eyes, drinking the wine, I want you to bite the berry inside your glass. I want you to be with me when we pick the berries. This year, I would say we're going to start the Gros Lot if nothing happened. We'll, we'll probably start the, uh, the sparkling wine on the 25th of August. And Gros Lot, probably we will start by mid-September, third week of September. Yeah, there's a long time to go, but that's roughly the, uh, the idea. So I want you to be with me, picking those berries and biting the fruits. The best definition of wine I have ever had in my entire life, it's my little one. She's eight. She drink wine and she said, because everybody wants to smell uh, raspberries, strawberries, pineapple, fruits, leather, healthy, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things that somebody could not even feel and I'm part of those people. And she said, oh, it smells like berries. And I say, yes. At the beginning, a bottle of wine, it's berries. We have to, don't forget this thing. A bottle of wine at the beginning is berries. So it smells like berries. And if you got those flavors in the berries, I want you, I want to bring those flavors inside the bottle. That's really the idea. So, Chateau de Montguerin, 100 hectares, in the Anjou region, 
on a chalky character and a little bit of schist. Schist, it's like a, a, a slate soil. And that's good also because on a slate soil, the water could go through. So there is also this kind of a nice, perfect water fitting regulation like the chalk. And the schisty soil will give you the minerality. What is minerality? Do you know what is minerality? Minerality, it's a kind of a difficult expression and sensation because everybody will, when you do a tasting, everybody will talk about what are the uh, 200,000 times of minerality, a lot of minerality, you can feel the minerality. And Okay, but at the end of the day, minerality means rocks. Do you have ever eat rocks? Do you have ever soak rocks? Do you have ever drink rocks? No, me neither. Uh, if you start, it's going to be a problem, but that's again another story. So what is minerality? It's really difficult, but one of the closest feeling to minerality is saltiness. When you have this feeling of saltiness, you just dry a little bit your palate and you have to taste. That's what we could define as a minerality. The other thing in terms of flavor, it's when you have those wet stone. That's those two things. But that's really, really difficult because strawberry, you could look at it, you could smell it, you could eat it. So you couldn't tell what is strawberry. But minerality, that's really difficult. So again, saltiness and this uh, drying character at the aftertaste, that's really the thing for me which is really important with uh, minerality. So, chalk, schist for minerality, grolo, cavernet, gamay. So now we are in. Because at the end of the day, we speak too much and we never drink, so we have to drink. Thank you to everybody. I highly recommend you guys pour yourself a glass so that we can start the we can start tasting the wines and describing the wine with uh, with Pierre Jean. If there is any question, please huh? do not hesitate to uh, to ask. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, either you can use the raise hand icon once again uh, that's available on Zoom to let me know that you'd like to speak, or if you want, you can send your question into the group chat so that I can, I can, so Pierre Jean can see it or I can ask it to him. Don't hesitate. All right. Okay. So, do you know, it's a stupid question, but there is no stupid question. Uh, do you know how we make rosé wine? There's two ways, two ways of making a rosé wine. First of all is we put all the berries inside the tanks. And as you know that the skin is red, but the pulp is white. So we have to make a, a maceration between the skin and the pulp to extract the flavors and to extract the color. So we do a maceration of berries inside the tanks. It's between overnight, 24 hours, eight hours. It depends on the berries, vintage, and what you want to extract. A deep, massive rosé, light rosé, and again, the vintage. If you look at the vintage, like a 2003, which was a really, really warm, warm summer, the skin was already uh, moving inside the pulp because there is a complete destruction of the uh, element of the skin because it was really dry. If you look at the vintage 1997, 1992, 1994, 2007, those vintage are what we call a cool vintage. Those vintage, we need to make a longer maceration to get the same color. So vintage is really, uh, every single vintage, it's a white page and we have to restart the story every year. That's why it's really interesting. And uh, we, we, we never make our best vintage. So best vintage is the next one because we learned every vintage. So first of all, we put the berries inside the tanks. We do a maceration overnight and then we open the valve on the bottom of the tanks and we extract the juice which was um, macerated with the skin. Or the other thing we could do is, and we call it rosé de saignée, it's French, or we could do a direct press uh, rosé. So we put the, rose, the berries inside the press and we uh, turn the press to get a little bit of a maceration and destruction of the, uh, the skin. We press it and we've got the rosé. 
So usually we've got both of them on every single uh, process because as you can imagine, when you overnight the, um, the, uh, the skin, you get a, a deeper color, but when you do a direct pressing, you get a lighter color. And it's always interesting to get inside the cellar all the different color because then we blend those color together to go to exactly what we want in terms of color because we can't make a decoloration. It's not possible in AOP wine. I can't do it. So we need to, to, to work with what nature gives us. So we usually use both of them. That's the first thing. So for Chateau de Montguerre, it's roughly 30% of uh, skin contact in tanks and 70% direct from the press in terms of color. And we get a different range of different color inside the, um, inside the cellar to work. Then, when uh, we extract the color, we've got this nice pink color juice. So we did it into uh, stainless steel tanks. Um, I always make uh, my rosé in stainless steel tanks. I'm not using any oak for one big reason. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, barrel aged rosé. And my grandfather told me one thing. He told me, make the one you like, because if you're not selling this one, you will have to drink it. So it's better to like it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a stainless steel tanks rosé, because I like it. And you usually do better things that you like. That's roughly also the philosophy. So we've got this nice pink juice, and we start fermentation in stainless steel tanks. Neutral, just to get the flavors of the berries. So we start to rise the temperature till, uh, so every single berries are fermented on its own. So Grolo, it's fermented alone. Cabernet, it's fermented alone. And Gamay is fermented alone for two reasons. Because they never get ripe at the same time. That's one of the things. And I want to get the varietal character on each side and then blend it together. So, but the same process for the fermentation, but everybody separately. So we start to rise the temperature till 14 degrees Celsius. And then it's thought to be a little bit uh, warm so the transformation of uh, sugar to alcohol. So we've got the fermentation and we've got this nice CO2 with a degas of CO2. And then we taste every day to reach the balance. Because as I told you, this is not a medium sweet, it's enough dry rosé. It means that there is some residual sugar inside. I'm, I'm not, uh, um, how could I say that? There is no uh, mathematic. There is some, but there is no mathematic. It depends on the vintage. Again, if I look at the opposite vintage, 03, 1997, for example, two different vintage, two different balance. One of them was completely, because uh, the warmer you get, the less acidity you have. And the more warmer you get, the more level of sugar you have. So the idea is more the balance. I'm not looking at exactly 13 grams of liter of residual sugar, no. I'm looking at some sweetness and freshness. So yes, some vintage, I'm, at, 12, first, at 12, 12 grams per liter of residual sugar, and some vintage, I go to 18, 18 and a half gram per liter of residual sugar. So it's really linked to the vintage. But profile speaking, vintage after vintage, I have an idea of what I want to get with the Chateau de Montguerre Rosé d'Anjou, but you could change in terms of uh, residual sugar. So for the uh, 18 vintage, we have uh, 14 and a half gram per liter of residual sugar. It's not one of the highest one for one big reason. In 2018, it was really warm during summer, like 17, like 19. So warm, acidity is a little bit lower. So the sugar, we want it a little bit lower too. So we taste the wine every day, just to reach this point with, this is a triptych acidity, fruits and sugar, and we want this balance. And if you're missing someone, the cuvee is gonna falling down. So you really need those uh, triptych. And when we reach the point, 
we drop the temperature till 4 degrees Celsius. So it's too cold. The yeast can't work anymore. And we do a cross-crow filtration. I don't know if you know what is cross-crow filtration. It's a process, whatever. But we filter the wine. There is no yeast inside the tanks. So we kept the natural sugar from the berry. It's not sugar added. It's natural sugar from the berry. So when you're drinking a Chateau de Montguerre Rosé d'Anjou, you're drinking one of the most healthiest beverage in the world. Drink wine and you're going to get 200 years of age. I'm almost 75. I look a little bit younger just because I drink a lot of these things. A lot. So, now it's true. It's, it's almost water, berries, and a little bit of uh, work. So, 18 vintage. So, a little bit of sugar, but not too much, again, because the acidity was not that high to balance it. So, when you look at the color, so obviously, we are always a little bit darker than a Provence because we are not using the same berries. Grolo, Gamay, and Cabernet, even if I told you that Grolo was not a big, massive, deep red berry, it's still uh, higher in terms of uh, Antocyan compared to the uh, Provence berries that you, you will have. So, it's a little bit deeper. It's a nice pink color with a little bit of a silver hint inside. Temperature speaking, it's really important. We, don't talk, we, don't, we didn't talk about the temperature speaking, but temperature is really important because the same wine has two different temperatures, it's two different wine. So temperature is really, really important. And you know that a room temperature in Singapore and in the Loire, it's not the same too. So room temperature doesn't mean anything. It's your environment. That's really important. If it's winter, if it's cold, you would prefer it a little bit warmer. And if it's uh, summer, really, really massively uh, hot, you will go lower in terms of temperature. And don't, for me, the, the, the better thing is chiller because a wine will always warm up. You just have to put your hands like that and you will warm up a little bit. So I prefer the one being a little bit chiller and needs to warm up if we need. But it's always better, to my opinion. And for a rosé, obviously, chilled. And then it depends which what you have the wine also. The food pairings mean a big thing. So, color speaking, temperature. So temperature for me would be starting by 10, 10 and then it will warm up. But not up than 10, okay? Because if it's way, 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 way too cold, it doesn't smell anything also. So, and that's good for the bad wine. If you have a bad wine in your cellar, serve it at five degrees and nobody will say anything. That's also another thing. So, color, light, pink, petal of roses. It's not onion because we don't want it onion colors. We want petal of roses. When you smell it, Raspberries, strawberries. I don't want to tell you exactly what you get inside because it's really something personal. If you say some, if you say to someone, "This is a strawberry milk flavor," and if those people in front of you didn't never have a strawberry in their life, it's like speaking in Chinese to me. I will never understand because recognize means knowing. To recognize something means knowing before. So it's part of your story. That's why I was telling you that the story of my little one, she's eight, she starts earlier just to, to build up his memories and build up his memories in memory. I say, yeah, that's strawberry, put it over there and you could recognize after. So all, this, all these little berries, red, you have it. Then somebody will, will find some strawberries, some people would find more raspberries. This is true. We are with those. That is really coming from the Grolo. This strawberry milk character, it's really, really the uh, Grolo thing. Then you move to a more purple, dark berries, like a black currant, things like that. And that's coming from the Cabernet. And then a tiny bit of a peppery flavors, and that would be the Gamay. Then some people would be more uh, sensitive to one of each. And again, it's part of your 
a story. But that's really the uh, element of, of what you have inside. Then you have a little hints of uh, um, grapefruits. You have a little of, uh, hints of minty character. Minty is also coming from the gamay. You also have a little bit of uh, hints of uh, apricot. That's the flavor you will have in the... Uh, I prefer to say bouquet than nose. I prefer to say bouquet. I don't know if you understand bouquet compared to nose, but it's, it's nicer. Then you drink it. The first flavor, the attack, is a tenderness, the sweetness. But I don't want you to get this sweetness all along your palate. I want you to get this sweetness at the beginning when you just started to sip it. And then the aftertaste, then the Cabernet Franc is coming. You could feel the Cabernet Franc would just dry the sugar. The acidity will dry the sugar. So now you know what is of dry and medium sweet. If you don't tell anybody there is sugar inside this, people would say, yeah, I like it, it's fruity. Which is true, it is fruity. So tender at the attack, dry at the end. The acidity from the uh, Cabernet Franc will dry the sugar. So that's a really good deal. Because in one bottle of wine, you've got two wines. The sweet one and the acidic one. So buy one, get one free. That's a good deal. The other thing with the uh, Chateau de Montguerre Rosé d'Anjou, it's you will have the same flavors that you have on the bouquet in the palette. The little red berries are coming. I was talking about apricot. The flavor, the almost uh, softer of the skin of the apricot is coming. And then the minty, peppery, citrusy character dry the, uh, the aftertaste. So that's when you taste it. Then, which is the most important thing, when you enjoy this wine, you will enjoy this wine with some spicy food. Doesn't need to be burning, but spicy food. And you will have a complete different uh, rosé in your glass because the spice, the little fire of the spice, will be shut down thanks to the residual sugar. So everything with uh, curry, uh, how, how could you say that, the, um, uh, the Japanese, um, Wasabi. Thank you, wasabi. Uh, the boudin antillais, oh, great with boudin antillais or charcuterie in French. Um, yeah, Every, everything you have a little tiny spiciness on it, go for it. You do some shrimps, uh, big lobsters grilled, put some pepper, salt, and you could uh, end the cover with a coriander or a spicy on it, like a a bed of chorizo. So cooked a bed of chorizo, on top of it you put your lobsters and you have a rosé d'anjou. And you have the, the texture of the lobsters and then the spiciness of the chorizo who just goes through the, the texture of the lobsters and give you this little spiciness, goes perfectly with the rosé d'anjou. You could do also some salads, like a regular chicken Caesar salad, go perfectly with that because it's summer, fresh. It's still fresh and the acidity is still there. And if you go to uh, sweetness, if you want it to get a little bit of sweetness, I would say dessert, okay, but with acidity. Not sweet plus sweet, because sweet plus sweet is boring. So you already have the sweetness with the rosé. Bring some uh, fruit salad with a citrusy on it or things like that. A granité de fruits rouges. So you, you put your strawberries and raspberries and you put it in your... Uh, uh, congelator um, in your uh, in your freezer. You can put it in you. your freezer. In the freezer. I'm, I'm losing my English. That's really bad. I, I really need to stop the COVID and go back to uh, international. Anyway, so you put it in your freezer and then you defrost it and you put it in a blender just to get the uh, granité. So it's going to be a granité with the texture of the ice, but also the flavor. Put it on your plate. Citrusy on it, on it, lemon character, citrusy, four leaves of mint. You have a perfect dessert when it's warm, 
a glass of rosé d'Anjou with that. Great. Or you could also have some, uh, some crackers. A nice crackers like that, perfect, as an aperitif. So that's roughly the uh, Chateau de Bonguiret, uh, Rosé d'Anjou, and that's what I'm doing when I'm not uh, with you, uh, with my uh, computer, uh, in the wine tasting connection with uh, Singapore. So that's, gonna, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to do in the uh, May, June, July, August, in five months' time. I'm going to be right there. Do you have any question? Oh, thank you, Pierre, for all those different Pierre for those informations. I do have a question from someone in the chat who sent to me. So Fran would like to know: uh, Is the proportion of Grolo, Cabernet Franc, Gamay quite consistent everywhere every year? Uh, because she, uh, they feel that it's more spicy. So I'm wondering if it's typical of the Rosé d'Anjou. It could. It could. Um, the, the big thing is is usually driven by Grolo for. The, the Brady, the, the, fundament, the, um, the uh, fundamental cuvee, it's definitely driven by Grolo. For two reasons, because I don't want to change the identity of the Chateau de Montguerat, soil, berries, winemakers, and, and climates. And the other thing is sometimes we could change it again, a vintage which is warmer. I will probably decrease a little bit the Grolo for 15%, so go back to 55, 60, something like that, and increase a little bit the Cabernet to bring some acidity. Because I'm gonna have a, a rosé which is lower, general, in general, in terms of acidity. So if I bring more Cabernet in the blend, I will go up a tiny bit in uh, the acidity. So that's really the things with the, uh, with the balance with sweetness and acidity. We could work on the uh, date of picking. So the earlier you get, the more acidic you get. And also then you could move a little bit. So it's a corridor, huh? it's not like a VH, it's a corridor for the, uh, for the blend. And you could put a little bit more gamay for the spiciness and cabernet to kick the sweetness. Because the idea is really to kick the, uh, the sweetness of the wine. You want the sweetness, but you, I want you to feel the sweetness, but I don't want you to drink the sweetness. I don't know if I, uh, I answer the question. Uh, let me check with Fran. I'm going to go on to Fran to unmute you to see if you, <laughs> if he answered your question, if you wanted to rebound on it. Hi, Fran. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, for the 2018, you mentioned it was a warmer summer. So would that be considered a sweeter kind of year where you get more sugar? It's, it's on, on, the, uh, on, the, um, on the paper it would be a sweeter vintage. And then to get profile speaking, the Chateau de Montguerre Rosé d'Anjou that I'm looking for, I need to pick the berries a tiny bit earlier to don't get a massive amount of sugar and to keep this acidity. And yes, again, put a little bit more Cabernet Franc. Okay. And I never know what I'm gonna do until I pick the berry because I need to get the whole summer. If you look at the, uh, 2000 and that was uh, 2016 because 17 uh, no 2017 in 2017 it was pouring water until the 15th of June but when I say pouring water it means that every single day in the Chateau de Montguerret I had 10 milliliters of water every day so it's yeah mm. it was the first time where the cellar was overflowed for decade. So it was really pouring water. And then it turns to the uh, early July, like it was the, uh, fifth, the 6th of July, and it was one of the most drying summer that we get. So from an extreme, we went to another extreme. So back to July, I was kind of a, uh, scared to don't get the ripeness of the fruit. And then when I was in uh, August, I was obliged to call the workers, to call the team and say, okay, you're on holiday, but we need to go back to the vineyard because we need to pick the berries now because we were expecting the vintage being ready for 15th of September. And we start to pick the, to pick the berries by the uh, 28th of August. So 
it, 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 until, until we get the berries, we never know. So yes, 18 was a warmer vintage and I tried to manage Mother Nature, which I can't because Mother Nature is my only boss because she tells me when I have to work, when I have to swim, when I have to drink, what I'm going to drink, if I'm going to be on a terrace and what kind of food. So my only boss is really Mother Nature and sometimes she's not that nice with us, but we have to, to work with her. And that's also all the, uh, well, I like with the wine, it's nothing is written. But yeah, 18 vintage was a warmer vintage, so I have to work with date of picking and um, the percentage of Cabernet Franc to put it a little bit higher. And if it's a really cold vintage, like it was, uh, like we did in uh, 1994, for example, it was almost like a, not 100 percent, but uh, 87 percent of Grolo. Round there, because it was already uh, acidic with the uh, acidic enough with the Grolo. Thank you. And so, and can, I, can, can I also, also ask, um, like how? How quickly should one be drinking this? Do you drink this within two years of the release, or uh, you know, obviously, it's not for ages. no, I don't. It's it's a question. It's a it's a difficult. It's not a difficult question. It's an easy question, and there is many different uh, answers to that. You, you do definitely have the two years without any problem to drink it. the The big thing is where it has been stored. That's really the key things. And everybody, it, it's, it's funny, but everybody told me that, yeah, but we don't have any uh, setters. And I said, I don't care. Well, I don't need a setters. I need a controlled temperature. So I prefer you to be, I prefer you to put your wine in your bedroom because your bedroom is probably one of the best conditioning temperature in your house because it, okay, it's 20, but it's 20 from the 1st of January till the 31st of December. And it's way better to get 20 all year long than having an average of 13, moving from five, going to 40. And people sometimes put their wine in the uh, garage and on average, temperature is fine, but it goes to 40 and go to five. So storage is the key things, really, really important because you could cook the wine in six months. So storage, and then uh, avoid the light. If you could avoid the light, because light will kill also your, your wine. When I say avoid the light, I, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if it's on a table for a year, for, a, for two hours, okay? It's not a big deal, but avoid the light. And then if you, uh, if you get it, in, in, in two years time, the wine will be perfect without any problem. And then if you get more and more and more aging, and then you will change and you will be losing the red berries and moving toward these uh, Oni, Queens, uh, overripe fruits, like a dry uh, apricot and things like that. So it's, an, it's gonna be another wine and another food bearings too. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, friend, for that question. And thank you, uh, Pierre-Jean, for the very complete answer, uh, especially regarding different vintages. It's definitely a hard job, uh, interesting job for a winemaker to always see how you can uh, rearrange the quantities in the wine. Uh, let me see if anybody else uh, has any questions regarding it uh, or if they want to comment maybe on the wine. I'm going to go over and see Mrs. Nancy. All right, Miss Nancy, I'm going to unmute you. If you just have a question or just some feedback, if you enjoyed the wine, let him know. I enjoyed it very much as did my husband. He's not usually a rosé drinker. Can you hear me? A little, yep. not, yeah, okay, yeah. We enjoyed it very much, my husband and I both. It was way drier than I expected for a rosé. And my husband doesn't usually drink a rosé or a white wine, but he was happy with it. He's back to work now. Thank you very much. You make my day. Even if it's pouring water, you really make my day. And that was a definition of pleasure maker. If I gave you a little bit of pleasure today, I'm happy. I'm the happiest man in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, for those kind words. <laughs> 
I don't know if you can still hear us. Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, he greatly appreciates it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to check maybe with Mrs. Monica uh, if she has any question or feedback regarding the wine. Hi, Monica. Hey, hi. This is really something very different for me because I'm normally a... I normally drink red, and if it's a white, it's got to be really dry for me because I don't like the sweet wines at all. And for me, this is the first time I'm even buying rosé. I would drink it if it was served to me, but this is the first time I was buying. And the reason I bought it was because I checked it and I saw it was more on the dry side. And I said, you know, for a dry uh, French from Loire, I, it's something very different. And that's why I bought it. And I'm not, and I'm so happy. I'm so happy I did because. Uh, the minute I bought it, I opened the bottle. I got it like within a few hours. I opened the bottle and I, I chilled it and I opened it and I quickly told all my friends this is a good bottle and immediately it was sold out. So everybody's waiting for you to stock up a little bit more so that they can buy, you know. But it's really something that I was really surprised. Thank you. This is something that, and because of our weather, it's getting hot. It is so refreshing to have something like this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. I'm glad you, you enjoyed it and you discovered a rosé wine today with us, with a rosé d'Anjou. Uh, and so I'm yes. very happy you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep you guys updated if there's any more uh, from us in the future. <laughs> yeah, it did, so, it did sell out pretty fast, that's true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, let me see with, uh, we have a question with one of our regulars. I'm going to bother you guys again. Um, I'm going to check with Giovem, if you don't mind, if he has any questions or feedback or just general information. Oh. All right. Hello. Yeah, I, I must agree, Monica, uh, in her assessment that the wine is uh, really, really good. Um, and pleasantly surprising. Um, you, after hearing you explain and uh, describe, you can I can really taste the terroir uh, in in the form of your passion in making the wine, um, which is which is which is really great. I mean that that enhances the experience of drinking it even even more. Um, that's one. Two is uh, in terms of the the the, the, the bouquet. Uh, what struck me from the moment I pulled the cork out. Um, was was this very perfume, very light scented uh, notes coming out from the bottle itself? Never mind pouring pouring it into the glass, just from the bottle itself, which is just quite rare for uh, rosé, uh, at least in our experience. Um, and 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 that was quite surprising. So it's it, it, it's quite a treat for the for for for, for, for the uh, for the nose as well as for the taste. Um, because what we usually find um, with dry rosés is um, yeah, it's quite nice, quite pleasant as a summer drink, um, but it, it leaves the mouth very dry, and then you always have to find water to sort of quench the thirst, and that that, that defeats the purpose of drinking a uh, a, a cold you know, a cold wine on a summer's day. Um, you just want one beverage to do it all uh, and to make you happy. So I think this, as you can see, Marie is enjoying herself. Um, we, we both like this very much. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, and for, that, for that, those really nice comments uh, regarding the wine. It's definitely a very nice wine to enjoy. Um, I have another question, actually, uh, from Mrs. Fran, who would like to know, uh, why is the Loire region less affected by climate change compared to Germany? And do you have any comments on that? No, we, we, we are definitely uh, affected by the uh, global warming. Um, what really affect the uh, Loire region is, uh, as, as, we, as I told you, is the, uh, it's getting warmer. And people say that there is not, no problem. Yeah, there is, I can tell, not politically speaking, but I can tell when I look at what happened in the vineyards, it definitely changed. The idea is what affects the Loire is not really a question of profile, because we were at the limit north in terms of uh, wine production. 
the thing is, uh, what really changed is for the red. And red, it's a tiny production in terms of the, of the Loire. And it's mainly driven by the domestic market. But for the red, it definitely changed a lot in terms of consistency. And what really, really affects the Loire is frost. Because our problem is, um, for example, right now, I'm all a little bit more than two weeks ahead of schedule, which means that the bird are right now in a position of getting frost. And we get this uh, Epée de Damocles, you know, the, uh, I don't know the translation of Epée de Damocles, something uh, on top of your head who could just kill you. So we have to uh, live with that. Okay, I don't it's have any translation it's, No, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a French expression, but it's, a, it's something, it's a big massive risk. And the risk in France with the global warming, uh, the risk, sorry, in the Loire with the global warming is frost. If you look at the history, my great grandfather uh, look at me and he say, okay, Pierre, Pierre Jean, you will have probably one big disaster in your entire career. A disaster means 45 percent, 50 percent of damage. My father told me probably two. Right now, 19, 50 percent of damage. 18, normal. 17, on average, 42 percent of damage. 16, 30 percent of damage. 15 was okay, 14 was okay, 13, 25% of damage, 12, 50% uh, of damage, 11, okay, 10, okay, 9, okay, 8, 70% uh, of damage. That's really what's the problem right now in the, in the Loire. It's global warming in the Loire is be able to get berries. That's really the things. So, Profile speaking, because we were really at the limit up north, it doesn't change a lot. It changed, of course, but it doesn't change a lot. But definitely in terms of production, for us, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a really big, big, big challenge. For example, in the Muscadet, in four years, I get frost three years. Just, 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 just as an example. So. Yeah, and it's just because people say, yeah, we get frost, we get, no, we didn't get frost because to get frost on the 4th of April, it's normal in the Loire. There's nothing really strange about it, but having this vegetation at this stage on the 4th of April, that is not normal. That's a problem. So yeah, the big, the big issue for the Loire with the global warming, it's really the uh, consistency in production Quantity speaking, I should say. Okay, and she actually has a rebound question on that. So with all these climate changes going on, et cetera, affecting your vineyards, uh, how do you manage climate change in terms of your own vineyard management? So what we do is um, for the, for the uh, areas, the blocks which are known to be uh, um, where there is a risk of frost means the, 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 which one are on the bottom of the, what we call the cuvette on the bottom. And where they had some Chardonnay, for example, we deplant plant Chardonnay and replant some later on berries, like Golo, for example. If you look at the berries, Chardonnay gets really, really, uh, the, the bed bricks of Chardonnay is earlier. So if you get frost, the Chardonnay is going to be the first one to get, fr to get frost. So you put the Melon de Bourgogne where you are on the cold area. And when there is on the top of the hill, when there is no the, uh, the, the, the risk of frost, you put, for example, your Chardonnay. So it's an example, but we have to change a little bit the, uh, the, uh, the blocks and the grape variety with the, uh, the risk of uh, being frost. We invest in the uh, um, fan, you know, what, you know, fan to... Uh, to, to blow some warm air with, a, with a f the fire on, on the bottom. So we invest on fan. 
and um, we change a little bit the uh, timing of pruning. So we try to push later, 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 later the, uh, the pruning season. And also what we try to do is we try to uh, put the, uh, usually the, the baguette, the cube of the vine, we round it around the iron wire. And we try to keep those baguettes uh, upside because we gain at least one meter and it could be sometimes here, zero, and here it could be minus one. So we try to, we call it plier, so we plier the baguettes later. Um, again, what we could do is uh, we light some uh, uh, candles, big candles in the vineyards, every, it's uh, six meters and six meters. So every six meters, you get a, a, a big candles just to, to light some fires when you got a risk of a, so we do have some few things. We could also uh, hire some uh, helicopters just to, uh, to get some uh, uh, convection of air. So there is few things, but what we have to know is everything we have, it's working between minus three and zero. When it's minus seven, it's over. Okay, thank you for that very, uh, very complete answer. She said, it sounds very expensive to make wine if <laughs> you need to employ so many techniques. <laughs> it's, it's, I would say some vintage could be very expensive to make wine. Some of them, it's like 1947, because everybody talk about 1947, which was the best vintage ever. A vintage is a tiny small things happening at the right timing together. And everything comes at the right timing, you make 1947. If sometimes it changes a little bit, then you, you go down to 15 or 19 and then 17 and then 18 and then 1994 and 1992. So it's a little bit of few things who just arrive and what, when mother nature decide to bring everything at the perfect timing and you are like in heaven. It's just perfect. But it's not every vintage. Okay, thank you. I think I think that that definitely answered uh, the question. Um, does anybody else have a few last questions that they would like to ask Pierre Jean uh, regarding vineyard management or uh, wine, the appellation in itself? Yeah, Marie has a question. All right, lower your hand. All right, go ahead. Just a quick one. Um, just wondering if you use synthetic cork. The reason you use it is the same as you using stainless steel tank. Sorry, I didn't understand. Ah, could, the reason could you, you repeat, please? Sorry. Is that the same reason as you using the stainless steel tanks? The use of a uh, synthetic cork. Um... Yeah, I'm using synthetic cork for the uh, for the wine. I'm which are in the um, in stainless steel tanks because it's not. When you are in the uh, stainless steel tanks, you want the fresh, crisp, and livelier flavors of the uh, of the wine, like you want to drink in time when you're drinking a rosé. And it means you don't need to get an evolution with oxygen. And when you're using synthetic cork, you don't have this uh, uh, perme permeability. You know what permeability with the oxygen because you want to keep it fresh and clean. So usually, when we use barrels when you need this kind of a barrel age and oxidation of the wine, we usually put some uh, natured uh, cork on it. Uh, the, the thing is, the, uh, the other closure would be really nice with this Rosé d'Anjou would be screw cap. But French are so stupid and French are drinking this wine and they don't like screw cap. Sorry for that. That's true. There's a global uh, French aversion to to screw cap in in general. <laughs> I hope I hope that uh, that answered your question, Marie. Uh, perfect. Does anybody have a small another question that they would uh, like to ask Pierre Jean? Let me see if anybody's hands are raised. Not just yet. Any more in the comments? Okay. So if anybody's still thinking of a question, I have a question for you. Um, maybe a more informal question. So you said your daughter likes to taste your, your red wine from time to time. Do you think she wants to work in the winemaking industry later on? 
this is, this is the fourth generation and maybe you're preparing would her be, to be, would be probably the most happiest man in the world or father in the world but i don't want i don't want to push her i want her to to do it because she likes it so yeah i'm i'm trying to you know to do it but i don't want i don't want to yeah. tell her you need to be a winemaker because i want her to to like it I, when i was a uh, three years of age, four years of age, I felt inside the tanks. You know the Obelix story? Who felt inside the uh, magic potion? It's a French uh, cartoons. And uh, I did fell inside the tanks when I was three years of age. When you are in the Muscadet region, where I grew up, all the tanks are underground. So when you're walking inside the winery, the winery in, the, in the Muscadet region, you're walking on the wine. It's kind of a Jesus thing, but it's wine. Walk on the wine. And I was three years of age, and I wanted a, uh, a glass of juice from the press, from juice from the, uh, from the harvest. And I walked inside the winery, and I felt inside the tanks. And my father catch me by the collar. So I was completely wet of Melo de Bourgogne. Until this time, I didn't remember. My father remembered because he was scared by losing me. But I, I don't remember, to be honest with you. But I think till this time, I've got more Loire wine in my blood, and that's why I'm a winemaker. But I'm, I'm, going, to show you a, I'm going to show you a picture I'm going to show you a picture which is definitely the best definition of a That's my little one. And that's the older one. All right, right, right. They're yeah, blending into the family business pretty well. well you know, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell them to be a winemaker, but I'm pushing hard. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, no, because not everybody uh, actually starts off in winemaking. We've had some winemakers on here who, uh, who came from winemaking families, but then they decided to do something else. But 10 years later, they're like, actually, I want to work in wine. So it's always really interesting to see how people uh, end up in the winemaking industry. It's usually you. Uh, it's it's like a, there's two. I think that there's, there's two ways. There is a way that I want to do what was what my grandfather, my father, my grandpa, blah, blah 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 blah. And there is the opposite. I'm not the guy who's gonna follow because uh, I'm gonna do my own story. So it's and then ten years after that, I say, okay, I did my own story for ten years, but wine is so good. I need to go back to the wine. And, and here you are, and here you are. It's very <laughs> nice story. All right. Um, if right. I'm going to look around, see if anybody has any more last questions that they would like to ask Pierre-Jean before we uh, bring this session to an end. Let me see if any more hands are raised. Dun, dun, dun. Any more comments? Okay. All right. Well, I think everybody's questions so far have been answered. Um, so just a reminder for everyone that's here today, if you ever do have a question that pops up into your mind uh, in the days following the session, don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, send an email to my address uh, that was on the Zoom uh, link information so I can forward it to Pierre-Jean. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pierre-Jean, for this uh, really informative session on Rosé d'Anjou. I hope everybody had a, a nice time, learned a lot about the wine, how Rosé is made, and the particularities of this appellation. Uh, just before I pass you the mic, I just want to check if everybody, I try to do this uh, uh, every time, if we can take a small screenshot with everyone with their wine glasses uh, raised and full of wine, if you still have wine, unless... Some people have already reached the end of the bottle, but hopefully. <laughs> All right. I <didn't> have it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, I'm going to go into group mode. All right. If you don't want to be on camera, no problem. I'm going to take the screenshot now. Okay, everybody got your glasses ready. Okay. One, two, and three. Okay. Anjou. <laughs> okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoy the uh, the tasting. Uh, whenever you come to France, you've got a chance to come to France. Please 
come to my place and I would be very, very happy to host you and do a tour and a visit and so on. So please come to my land of happiness. Thank you very much, Pierre-Jean. <laughs> All right, if you guys ever are in the region, don't hesitate to go and say hi. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, I thank you all for being here tonight and I wish you guys all a wonderful evening. Enjoy the rest of the bottle with, uh, with alone or with friends, with food or without. Uh, and I'll see you guys all uh, next time for our next uh, live masterclass. All right. Okay. Oh, I'm going to be. Thank you, Pia John. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.